Hello, um, this time we have a pair of KEF reference 104s, or model 104s I should say, well reference series, they're known as the reference 104s. This is another set of speakers that's come from um, Phoenix who also sent me his um, PSBs which are now finished, I will do a part 3 on those, they've turned out really well, very pleased with those. Um, so yeah, he also sent me these and his Kef Cadenzas as well, but um, today is the turn of these. Um, cosmetically, they're in reasonable condition. they are not got corner knocks or anything like that. Um, I'm not sanding these or oiling them again or any, anything like that. He's, he's quite happy with the, um, the way they look, their patina. Um, but I have got to make some new covers for them. Um, he's made his own, which um, have kind of fallen apart. So I'll cut some new um, plywood uh, covers for these. And um, I think he wants to retain the cloth that he was using as well, which is kind of a lighter colour. Goes quite well with the wood. Um, so yeah, just to tell you a, a bit about these really. These have the um, Kef B200 woofer. Not sure what variant it is, um, can't remember, the 1034 or something like that, I don't know. Um, Kef's T27 tweeter, which is a fantastic unit, and a auxiliary base radiator, which is kind of the, um, the B139 without the motor on the back of it. So um, yeah, these rumble down quite low, they do have decent base performance. Um, I can't say I'm a fan of the base radiator arrangement, um, but it does work well. This is a good driver. Um, I'm very familiar with it, and I've just used it as you probably saw in my Ditton 15 slash BC ones, um, which I've sold. They're off to Bristol. Um, so yeah, these um, need a bit of attention, and there's quite a bit going wrong with them. So. Let's have a talk about the measurements I took first. Um, right, let's have a look. Okay, so if we take a look at this one first, um, the serial number on this ends in 30, so I'll refer to this as 30, and the other one serial number ends in 23, so I'll refer to that as 23. So they're, they're not matched, a matched pair. I don't know if these were ever sold as matched pairs, um, a lot of these larger speakers back in the day were sold as individual units so you'd go to a shop and they'd probably have I don't know 20 of these in the old storeroom and if you bought a pair you'd just get whatever two came out of the storeroom I think that's kind of how it worked um, so yeah chances of them being matched in a factory were pretty remote really and parts tolerances being what they were um, right, okay, so let's talk about this one first. Um, on axis, not too bad. Um, I'll put in the um, on axis measurements now so you can have a look. Yeah, so this one's not particularly smooth. Um, there's quite a lift between about 1500 hertz and 4 kilohertz, which is probably going to make these sound a bit bright and shouty. Um, and that shouldn't be there, so we need to have a look at that. Um, there's also a nasty little lump around 600 hertz as well, so I'm not too sure what's going on there. Um, between 4000 hertz and 10 thousand hertz there's a buttload of distortion so i'll stick that measurement in now so that's all in the tweeter range so i'm hoping it's not the tweeter um i've come across loads of these that have had issues like this um sometimes it's crossover related sometimes it is the tweeter they've been driven too hard um, and then they have this attenuation switch on them, so 
in the middle is the reference level so you would expect that to be a nice smooth response and then you can I believe just kind of dip the mid-range a little bit um, the sort of effect that you would have if you went off axis um, and then you can raise it as well so if you were listening to these um, say they were fairly wide apart firing straight forward and you were sat in the middle you'd probably experience a bit of a dip um, you can raise that so that's the idea I believe behind that to help integrate it to your listening position um, I took measurements in each position of that switch on axis for this speaker which I put in now so as you can see you can kind of lift everything from 3k down up reference or down so that's doing what it should do um, I didn't take any off-axis measurements at the moment it's just not really worth me doing that um, also I, I just hate the way that these are all made with the woofers and tweeters on the same side you know it's a big baffle so I understand why they are pushed to one side but it would be nice if they were handed um, because the horizontal off-axis is going to be different left and right and ultimately that's going to affect how they integrate into the room um, the right is going to be a little bit different to the left not a huge amount but um, yeah I just it's a manufacturing cost sort of thing really isn't it uh, right let's have a look at the other one um, so what did I say about the other one um, I'll put its on-axis response in now so this will be the on-axis for this one So as you can see with this one, we have quite a big dip um, between, I don't know, 1000 hertz and 3 kilohertz, that sort of thing, um, which to me never seems an issue, believe it or not. Um, if a speaker is going to be a bit bright, forward and shouty, it's going to be in that 1 to 3k region, but that is a bit excessive. <laughs> Uh, you might have also noticed that the um, phase relationship between the woofer and the tweeter changes at the same position for both. So the crossover point is around 2.2k, I would have thought, um, which would make sense, really. Um, really, you don't want to push this too high up. Um, sorry, distortion in that one was really, really clean. I'll put that measurement in now. So no issues with distortion on that one, just a big dip response. We do have screws missing here, so they this isn't airtight. Very, you can tell when a cabinet's leaking because you'll push the woofer in and it will suck itself back out again as it's pulling air back through whatever it's the air is escaping from. Whereas a cabinet that's nicely sealed will be very springy. So if you find you're pushing your woofers in and they're staying in and slowly coming back, I'd probably say there's an air leak. Whereas nice and springy, as you push the cone in, you're compressing the air and that air is going to want to spring back the, uh, the cone, um, not hold it in. So whereas, you know, pushing it in, air leaks, you create a vacuum in the cabinet, let go of the woofer, it sucks that air back in to equalise the pressure. Um, I also took measurements with the adjustment switch, which I'll put in now. So as you can see, that switch is doing what it should do, same as this one. Um, and finally, here's a comparison of the two on axis. So that should tell you how kind of wildly out they are. Um, I've had a few pairs of these here before. Um, this is the first pair I've put on my channel. They normally measure really well, um, not like this. So there is a few things in this. So um, we'll take them apart and have a look. But what I'll do, I'll, I'll bring you in closer and we can have a, a look at the drivers and, and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, see what's going on. Right, 
So, base radiators. They're fine. I can't really see any issue with those at the moment. They are, rubbers are good. Um, this piece of polystyrene, absolutely fine. Beginning to go a bit sticky. Um, I think there's like a rubber coating on it that might be breaking down, but um, yeah, all in all, all good. Our KEF T27 tweeters look fine. Insulation's peeling back a little bit there, um, but otherwise, yep, they look good. We're missing a screw here, so that's one source of an air leak. Um, this one is all, all there. Uh, around the front here, I don't know, it looks like the grill frame has possibly been stuck on. Um, so I'll try and clear that off. But the woofers to me look like they've partially collapsed. Um, the suspension is really flat, like it's been stretched out. It will have would have a profile on it. And if you can imagine stretching that profile out, you'll pull this down. And it looks to me like it's slipped inside the cone. Here it's actually coming away. Uh, this one probably isn't as bad, but the rubber's very sticky as well, so whether it's breaking down. Um, here's a rather dirty um, B200. This is the 1022 version. And as you can see, the rubber is nice and rolled up. So that's what they should be like. And I, I've had two or three pairs of these. I've never seen them look like that. So that might be the cause of the response issue we have in the mid band um, they're just not springy enough to keep up with the signal and it's just dipping out um, it may be purely crossover related so we'll um, take them apart and see what's what I think we'll take this one apart first because I think this was the one with all the distortion yep so we'll take this one apart also Phoenix mentioned that this one cuts out or buzzes or something when you um, drive it a bit hard so yeah something's amiss so we'll get inside and have a look Doo -doo -doo -doo. so machine screws so we're gonna have T nuts behind these which is nice. So I have to be a bit careful with those not to push them in. Right. do is clip these cables off hopefully you can see that nope so I'm going to clip these cables off um, they're identified positive and negative but I just leave a bit of the insulation there in case so we'll have a look at these drivers shortly Big roll of foam in there. Just move that out of the way. Um, this foam's beginning to break down, and I don't think it should be in that way either. It's meant to be flat in the back up here, not rolled up. Um, we have another piece that goes round the bottom. We have a brace in here as well that also supports the um, back of the woofer. Um, bitumen pads to control the panels. Same thing you'd see in like the BC1, that sort of thing. I'll bring you in to have a, a look at that shortly. Um, right, let's take the tweeter out. So wood screws for these. go our lovely 8 ohm KFT 27 so these are pre-wired 
these go into the voice coil um, and they're just soldered together and then like some heat shrink over them so I'm going to clip that in the middle because I'll re-solder these and heat shrink them again T27 and we'll take our base radiator out as well machine screws again There we go, a B139 with no motor on the back of it. Big polystyrene um, cone, panel, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, that looks in good condition. Rubber's all good. So, yeah. Lots of foam in here, lots of panel deadening, which is really nice. Uh, foam's just kind of loose in there. Um, it does damp the panels a bit more if you actually glue this to the bitumen pad with like some spray glue. So I'll probably do that as I put them back together. Um, but yeah, there's a date stamp in here which is uh, March 1975. So what's that? They're one year, three months older than me. <laughs> I'll leave you to figure out how old I am from that. Right, let's um, take this out, which has our crossover on it. So what's happened here? So machine screws, but our T-nut has fallen in, which is probably in there somewhere. So you can see on these that the veneer is in a thin strip stuck to the top of the chipboard and the issue with that is when you knock it um, you expose the chipboard and that's something I've been trying to avoid with mine by using a real wood like that. So a hardwood bezel um, that the sits on top of the MDF I'm using and forms a lip which you fix your baffle to um, and then your veneer just rolls over it. You get this in the same wood as you're using as the veneer you're using and then uh, you know you can then any corner knock sand this down. No issues. Anyway I digress. Right. There is our crossover. Uh, yeah. That's quite novel. Okay, I'm going to clip this off and we'll take a, a good look at it. Right, I've taken both of them out and yeah, the capacitors have been replaced. That's fairly obvious. Um, but we didn't clip the tails off the back. So whether some of those are shorting against something, I do not know. That one's loose. Yeah, so we may have some dry joints. That's what it's looking like. Um, our little switch there, I think that needs a bit of cleaning. That's probably got something to do with our issues. Um, yep, same with the other one as well. The tails on the caps. Uh, yeah, that one's loose as well. Very loose. Okay, so hopefully we've found the source of our um, 
dip. Yeah, I can pull that one out. <laughs> um, and possibly distortion as well on a joint that's connection that's breaking down. Um, yeah, all loose. Okay. Well, that's a good sign. Um, the tweeter has been out. A uh, bit of cling film around the connection that pulled apart. Um, I expect we've probably got some, something similar around there as well. So, yeah. <laughs> um, right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to map this out, stick it on the whiteboard, and we will take a look at the crossover. And, um, yeah, then look at what we do with these. So these are all electrolytic, and I don't mind that in the woofer circuit in shunt. Um, I don't want to upset the Im impedance on that side of things. Um, but for the tweeter, no, 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 no. We don't want these um, in the critical signal path for our tweeter. That's just going to muddy things up and take away our detail. So I'm going to draw this up now and then we'll get back to this. Right, I've looked through this and drawn it all out. So I'll try and tell you what's going on. Let's look at the... Um, Let's look at the tweeter circuit first because that's the pretty simple one. Standard third order tweeter arrangement. So, excuse me, I've just drunk a load of water and it's given me the hiccups. Um, in on our positive, through a 4.2 microfarad cap, which is an odd value. I'm going to have to check these values to make sure they are correct. Um, so into a 4.2, carry on to a 5. And in between those, we have this little iron core inductor down to ground. Third order arrangement. Um, yeah. On our woofer circuit, this is where our switch has um, something to do with things. And I think is the cause of um, the dropout that Phoenix was experiencing. Possibly some of the other issues as well. Um, the contacts on this. So... This is just a switch to pick out different taps from this. I'll show you in a minute. So I'd imagine the contacts on that are pretty manky. So we're going to have to um, test that out properly. So this inductor here has um, an input and then three different taps. So what we're doing to create that dip is picking different values um, off this inductor. Um, so we roll it off earlier or later so rolling it off earlier gives us more of a, a slope um, between how that meets the tweeter um, so yeah so by increasing the milli henry value of this you're going to pull your um, roll off further down so that's how it's working here are our cables coming out so we go in through this inductor first Hit our switch so you can select which leg you're connecting to. And then on the output of the switch, we go through another inductor to our woofer. And then we have a 5 microfarad capacitor down to ground. I think that's correct from memory. So third order arrangement on here. So that switch is directly in the signal path for our woofer, which is covering the mid-range as well. So not ideal, but hey... It's one of the features. So um, yeah, that's that's it. I don't know the value of these yet. Um, I'll measure those in a minute and we'll see what's what. Okay, so there's our selector switch. You can see the wiper moving across there. So brown is our output. And then we have our three different values which we can select from. There's a ton of corrosion in this so um, what I'll do I'll clean this up with um, <clears throat> one of these kind of fine wire brush pens and then probably spray some deoxic in there as well but I'm pretty sure that's the source of um, some of the issues we're experiencing and just give it a damn good clean because it's dusty as hell um, yeah right okay let's see what we have going on in terms of okay, so values. what I've done I've clipped off the 
the brown which is the output from the switch um, so we don't pick up any of the other components on the crossover and one lead on a positive in so that will be in through this inductor and then we can select the output from our switch so in the reference position um, we are measuring 2.7 millihenry so that's quite a big value and if we move to the minus that changes to 3.5 so that's increasing the value of that inductance which is pushing our roll off further down so if we go back to the middle position uh, 2.7 again and the positive that value should drop um, to 2 so we've got 3. Point, was it 3.5 yep 3.5 2.7 and 2 so all we're doing is controlling that that roll off um, but yeah not the best thing to have in the signal path but that's how it works Right, just going back to this, um, this little inductor on the tweeter is 0 0.23 millihenry and this inductor here is um, 0 0.62 millihenry. So there we go, I'll stick a picture of the crossover schematic in now. Right, so the other thing I want to do is have a look at these woofers. So this one has come out of... Ah, look, there's one of our T-nuts for our um, crossover board. Quality. I'll probably find the other one on the other woofer. Um, right, so this has come out of the speaker ending in 23. And what did I make note of? This is the one with a big dip in it. Um, which, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is all crossover related. Um, and there wasn't any distortion in this one so you can see here how the suspension has lifted it's gotten hot and it has deformed quite a bit So these are the 1039. So the cone feels nice and free. It has sagged though. This is the suspension's lost all its shape. Yeah, it's just not not springy. So let's have a look at the other one. Yeah, nice and free. But you can see that this to me has sunk in so like the glue has given up or become soft and the suspension has dropped in which has stretched out the suspension and they're just not I don't know there's no elasticity there and there should be it's gonna make them a bit lazy right let's have a quick resistance check on our voice coil six point nine ohms yeah you can see there that's really seen some action Yeah, 6.9 as well. 
Yep. Let's have a look at our tweeters while we're here. Um, 8 ohm nominal 6.2 yep this has gotten twisted up quite badly Not the end of the world though So six ohms on that one, a little bit different, nothing I'm too worried about though, that's not uncommon at all. Okay. Right, so I'm going to resolder this 5 microfarad cap down properly on the woofer circuit and I'm going to replace these two with polypropylene. Phoenix wants these to be um, bi-wireable, bi-ampable, so what I'm going to have to do is firstly find out where he would like a new set of binding posts fitted to the back. Um, I'm going to retain this board for both the woofer and the tweeter circuit but what I'm going to have to do is break off one of them um, and the easiest thing to do would be to break off the tweeter circuit because we've got this switch mechanism and that sort of thing so what I'll end up doing is not picking up the positive for our tweeter here so that leg will come out and be fed with a new positive terminal on the back of the speaker and then where we come out of this capacitor to our tweeter I can retain that because there's no other relationship to the rest of the board. Um, what I'll have to do is lift up the grounding leg of that inductor and feed that with its own negative and that will also be the negative for our tweeter. So yeah not the end of the world so I need to leave that leg up and that up so this board will be um, again for both but the original inputs will be doing the woofer. We'll have a new pair for the tweeter.
um, to make these bi wireable and to replace the capacitors. So the five microfarad that we had on the woofer circuit that's been tested and just soldered in properly. That was kind of loose and not making properly. So yeah, one thing fixed. So now what I've done is broken out the tweeter circuit. Um, also on the woofer I've rewired it, so new copper input, copper cable output. Right, so on our tweeter, this is our new set of input cables. We come in through a 4.2, so two capacitors together to give us that value. And then we carry on to a 5, so I've used a 4.7 and a 0.3 to make our 5. Um, and then out of that we come out to our tweeter negative. In between those we were grounding with this inductor to make our third order. So what I've done, I've lifted up the leg of the inductor that went to the negative of this so we don't have the um, any electrical connection between the woofer and tweeter circuit. Now we're making them bi-wireable. Um, so my negative comes into that and then the positive out to our tweeter because that's connected out of phase. So yeah, these are now, these are the two cables that will go down to the binding posts. For the time being, I'll just put them in the same one. Woofer, tweeter, switch has been cleaned up, all our joints corrected. Job done. Right, so in part two, we'll put all this back together and test them all up and see what's what. But I'm fairly sure we ideally really want to find a pair of new pair of woofers for these um, because they're just they've gone sloppy they really have but you know that's going to be a uh, four screws to take them out resolder the new ones in it's not going to stop us getting all this back together okay catch you on part two